Ever since Apple announced its move away from Intel to its own silicon, the internet has been awash with people making predictions about what that might look like. And it's awash with people calling it Apple Silicone, uh, which would be a different thing altogether. There are some interesting videos out there predicting how fast Apple's CPUs might be, but many seem to be missing some very key points. And you can't predict future growth in computing by looking at the past. In fact, some would say you shouldn't try and predict anything about the future of computing. Uh, just ask these guys. Anyway, I'm going to put my neck on the proverbial block and make some predictions. But first, let's look at what we know about Apple's CPU making ability. And we'll just start by taking a look at the last three chips which Apple has produced. That's the A11, A12 and A13 Bionic. These are found in various recent generations of the iPhone and iPad. And we'll start by looking at a benchmark test to see how they perform. And then we'll compare them against the top three consumer Intel chips that are available in Apple computers. I'm not including the Xeon CPUs in the iMac Pro and Mac Pro. I'll come back to those at the end. This comparison is made easy thanks to Geekbench 5 and its online lead tables. If we go to the iOS lead table, we can see the performance of these CPUs in order. So we'll start with single core performance. Now for those less technically minded, single core performance is important because it's what you notice in your everyday computing tasks. Things like uh, web browsing or writing a document in Word. And a faster single core score in this test generally means faster performance. Now I say generally because benchmarks are a set of tests intended to represent real world usage. But since we all use our computers differently, those tests may not represent your real-world usage. And plus, they don't take into account things like the speed of your hard disk. I mean, that one factor alone can make a huge difference to the performance of your computer. Also, we should say that there is some variance between CPUs of the same model. Some will score higher than others. And likewise, the score will change based on how much background processing is happening on the computer when the benchmark app is run and how hot or cold the computer is. So the scores that we see here are averages of all of the tests that end users have run and uploaded to Geekbench. Nonetheless, the same is true of all the results on here, so we do have a stable point of comparison. So let's take a look. If we start with the A11 chips that you find in the iPhone 10 and iPhone 8, we can see that they're around about the 920 mark with the score. If we have a look at the A12 CPUs, uh, now these were found in the iPhone XS, XR, the iPad mini 5th generation, the iPad Air 3rd generation, and then also in the iPad Pros as the A12X and A12Z or Z. The iPad Pro CPUs aren't any faster on single core performance, so we can group all of those together and we'll say that the average is about 1113. And then at the top of the list we've got the A13 CPUs, which we find in the iPhone SE, the new one, and the iPhone 11. And they're sort of averaging about 1325. So what do these scores actually mean? Well, let's bring in the three top scoring Intel chips for single core performance. That is the top three chips that we find in Apple computers. So in Geekbench, if we go up to benchmark charts and then select the Mac benchmark chart, we can see there it sets a single core, Let's find the third fastest. So that's here, that's the MacBook Air, the early 2020 model, with the Intel Core i7 1060 NG7, and that scores 1139. Uh, second fastest is the Core i7 1068 NG7, as found in the 2020 13 inch MacBook Pro, that scores 1229. And the fastest is the iMac 27 inch early 2019 with the i9 9900K and that scores 1242. So let's put all of these scores together now on a chart so that we can see how things compare. And when we do that, you can see, yes, your iPhone scores higher than the fastest consumer Mac for single core performance. Of course, modern computing is based on multi-core performance and that can help in a couple of different ways. Uh, firstly, a multi-core CPU allows the operating system to distribute tasks more efficiently, so it can give maximum performance to single-threaded apps. Secondly, it allows multi-threaded apps to run much faster. Things like professional audio, video, and imaging applications that make use of all of the cores of the CPU. 
But when we look at multi-core performance, we need to separate out the Apple CPUs a little more because those A12X and Z chips have got more cores than the standard A12. So in Geekbench, if we go back to the iOS benchmark chart and then select multi-core, we can look then for the A11 chip, which we find down here, and we can see uh, we've got a couple of results. It's scoring around about 2,330. Uh, the A12 gets its fastest result in the iPad Air third generation, and it scores 2,869. Next, we've got the A13, which we find in the iPhone 11s. In the Pro versions of that phone, we can see that it scores about 3,380. So we can see that the A12X and A12Z CPUs actually outperform the A13 when it comes to multi-core performance. The A12X is averaging around 4,600, but we can see that the A12Z is faster and it hits 4,626 in the latest 12.9-inch iPad Pro. So again, let's go back to the Mac benchmark chart and go to the multi-core page. And what we want to do again is bring in the fastest three consumer Intel chips to compare. We'll ignore the Xeons there for the Mac Pro and iMac Pro at the top of the list. So the third fastest is the MacBook Pro 16-inch. Uh, that's got the Core i9-9880H, the eight-core CPU, and it scores 6,629. Uh, you note that the same CPU can be had in the 15-inch MacBook Pro, but it scores slower. And that's because the 16-inch MacBook Pro has a slightly bigger chassis and slightly better cooling, so the performance is better. Uh, the same thing is true then of the next CPU on the list, which is the i9-9980HK. Again, an eight-core CPU. Uh, I think it's pretty much the same as the uh, as the H CPU, but it's uh, slightly overclocked. In the 16-inch MacBook Pro, that hits 6,954. And then the fastest Mac for multi-core performance is the, again, the 27-inch iMac the 2019 model with the i9-9900K. Again, an eight-core CPU, but a much higher wattage because it's in a desktop computer, so it scores 8,289. So again, let's put all of those results onto a chart so that we can compare them properly. So the current Apple CPUs are some way behind in multi-core performance. But if we go back to the Geekbench 5 league table, let's have a look for something closer to the A12Z in terms of multi-core performance, just to see how it compares to Intel chips. So it's somewhere between the 21-inch iMac from 2019 with the i5-8500 CPU in. You can see their scores uh, 4,721. Then we've got a couple of Pro Macs, which we'll exclude. And we've got then the 27-inch iMac from 2017 with the i7-7700K and that scores 4,548. So that's the sort of level that the A12Z is currently at. So should we conclude from all of this that Apple Silicon will be excellent for single core performance, but is going to lag behind Intel on multi-core? No. There are a number of reasons why we can be confident about that. Uh, these current Apple chips that we're looking at are all found in mobile devices, phones and tablets. And Apple has already said that it is developing new chips for its computers. Some people assume that these new chips will be based on an A14. And what they then do is look back at the performance improvement for previous generations, from the A11 to A12, A12 to A13. Look at that percentage improvement and then apply that to the new A14 to try and predict how fast the new CPU is going to be. In data analysis terms, this process is known as extrapolating. And it's not a great idea because it isn't any more accurate than guesswork. Just because something has been happening doesn't mean it will continue to happen, particularly if some of the key variables are changing. If we take this 13-inch MacBook Pro as an example, it's got a larger chassis than an iPad, and that allows for better cooling of the CPU. In fact, inside this computer, there are copper heat pipes that link the CPU to two cooling fans. Whilst it may not be a lot bigger than the iPad, those small differences in size can make for big differences in thermal performance. We've seen this with the 15-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros. The 16-inch is only slightly bigger than the 15-inch, but its thermal performance is considerably improved. Uh, so let's talk about why that is, but to keep this simple, as a rule of thumb, the faster the CPU clock frequency, the more power it needs. And the more power it uses, the hotter it gets. Heat is the enemy of fast CPU performance. These chips are designed to slow down or throttle as they get hotter in order to stop them from overheating. And this is what is known as thermal throttling. You also need to know that the relationship between power requirements and CPU clock frequency is not linear. Higher clock speeds require disproportionately more power. So we're playing a balancing game. 
Apple wants its devices to be thin and light, but that compromises thermal performance. At the same time, they want longer battery life, and that means keeping the power requirements of the CPU under control. But what happens if we have a bigger chassis? The CPU in this 13-inch has a thermal design of 28 watts, and the 16-inch takes a 45-watt CPU. That i9-9900K in the 27-inch iMac is a 95-watt CPU, and that top-performing A12 chip in the iPad Pro, 7 watts. So if Apple designs a chip specifically for a notebook or a desktop without the limitations of a small mobile form factor, what could that look like? Apple Silicon is based on ARM designs, and they feature an architecture called Big Little. There are high performance cores and low performance cores. If you take the A12X as an example, there are four of each. If the workload is small, the four little cores will be used, whereas if demand is higher, the big cores will be used. And again, we're keeping things simple for this video. This combination of high performance and low power cores is what gives ARM CPUs their excellent power characteristics. What's key though is that Apple is free to build upon and enhance these designs. They can take away the thermal and power limits, and they can increase clock speeds. They can add more cores, or they can change the balance between the number of big and little cores to reach an optimal design. They also make use of the T2 chip in their computers to take care of some subsystem and security tasks, and also to accelerate certain types of video. And if Apple keep that design, and I see no reason why they wouldn't, then that frees up the notebook and desktop versions of their CPUs and allows them to squeeze even more performance out of them. Bear in mind that Apple will almost certainly introduce these new chips first in lower-end consumer laptops, uh, things like the MacBook Air and the entry-level 13-inch MacBook Pro. And users of such ultra-portable machines are less concerned with raw computing power and more concerned with battery life. Apple has made a big thing in the past about having all-day battery life. Just imagine the kudos of announcing a laptop with two-day battery life. They'd sell a heck of a lot more laptops if they could do that than they would by just bumping the performance. So here's my first prediction. With a proper thermal design, the existing Apple Silicon is already at a point where it is on par or outperforming the CPUs that already exist in Apple's ultra-portable laptops. So for their first chip, I'd expect a modest performance boost and a focus on increased battery life. And my second prediction is that when it comes to larger notebooks and the iMac, I'd expect there to be an option for a new CPU with a higher core count that performs at least as well as the Core i9 in the iMac 27-inch. And if Apple achieve that, it will be a great start to the transition away from Intel CPUs. What about the Pro machines with the Xeon processors? The top Mac Pro CPU is a 28-core Xeon, which scores 19,157 in Geekbench. I doubt Apple is anywhere near that yet with its own silicon, but will it get there? Absolutely. There's no way that Apple would start this transition if they didn't believe that they could at least equal the performance of their current lineup. It's not exactly unprecedented either. There are already ARM CPUs that outperform the 28-core Xeon. In fact, earlier this year, a company called Ampere announced an 80-core ARM CPU that they claim has got more than double the performance of a Xeon Platinum 8280, and that chip is in turn faster than the 28-core Xeon in the Mac Pro. So yes, it can be done, but it may take a little while. In fact, I think, and you can call this my third prediction, that Apple knows it can produce chips that outperform Intel at every level. And what's more, they have the unique position of being in charge of both hardware and software, so they can optimize their systems to get the maximum performance out and make it happen. Now, of course, the market share of Apple computers sold with these massive Xeon chips is tiny. The vast majority of customers will simply be looking for better battery life and equivalent or better performance to the current crop of Core i7 and i9 Intel CPUs. And I think we've seen that Apple can deliver that. Just finally, a quick word on graphics. The integrated GPUs in Apple's current silicon already outperform the best of Intel's integrated GPUs um, by a margin. And they're already more than halfway to a Radeon Pro 560X. And you can bet that they'll be working hard in that area as well. But that's another video for another day. So Apple Silicon is an exciting new era for computing. I've been waiting for ARM CPUs to take over for a few years now, and it's inevitable, I think, that things will go that way. Microsoft already has an ARM version of Windows, and it sells the Surface Pro X, which is equipped with an ARM CPU. Now, in truth, that hasn't been a big success, but Apple's got a number of clear advantages over Microsoft here. So don't assume that Apple's transition won't work based on Microsoft's failures. 
The biggest tech company in the world is not about to cripple its computer lineup. Apple Silicon Macs will be fast, energy-efficient computers that can run both desktop applications and mobile apps seamlessly. Sure, there will be some hiccups along the way, and early adopters will probably have to go through the pain barrier, but the pros for this process far outweigh the cons, and I'm looking forward to perhaps the biggest change to computing since the introduction of multi-core CPUs. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this content. No doubt some of you won't agree with my predictions, and that's fine. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, it's just my opinion at the end of the day. Uh, if you've got anything to add, uh, please leave a comment in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed the content, please consider supporting the channel with just one click of the subscribe button. Maybe I did enough to earn a thumbs up, or a thumbs down if that's your thing, but in any case, I'll see you next time for some more geekery.